Welcome back grade 11 students. This is Mr. Rowell here, getting you set up for your final project in the platformers unit. We're going to take things in a bit of a different direction this time. Rather than have you follow along with tutorials and copy over code, I think we're ready to be at the point where you get to do a bit more code analysis. To save some time, I'm going to be giving you the code for this section. And you're going to be reading it through, following along with my descriptions to try to make sense of the extra layers we've added on here. And then you're going to work to extend the functionality in a couple of ways. First, you're going to be trying to borrow some of the examples I show and apply it in your own contexts. So some copy and pasting of ideas, but you have to add your own little creative slant to it. And second of all, actually adding in your own self-developed functionality, which is the real interesting part. So let me show you what I got here in this sample project that I'm giving you. I haven't implemented everything. I want to leave some room for you to be designing things. But let's see what I've got. You'll notice that I have my Koopa who's moving around, changes direction. He's able to jump on his own. He's not perfectly implemented. He has some glitchiness with some of his actions. Actually, let me show you something here. I'm going to add in some coin blocks down below. And you're going to see that he gets a little bit confused when he's jumping into these coin blocks. He has a little bit of collision that works, but uh, sometimes in the movements he makes, he gets a little bit confused. Then he does turn into a shell when I hit him. Let's set it back to where he looks kind of nice and normal. When I hit him, he turns into a shell. That's the functionality. All right, let's look at my Mario. You'll see that my Mario does his spinning in the air. His other animations work great. Also notice there's now a floor that I'm standing on, both me and the Koopa. It looks like he's hovering a little bit here, something to maybe improve upon in his design. But my Mario looks like he lands exactly where he wants to. When I try and hit this block, notice, bam, bam, I hit it, I don't go through. When I land on the top, I stay on the top and I can move around just like normal. These blocks are considered like the floor. In my design, platform is the class in which I have um, defined my interactions. And all of the platforms are subclasses of this. So when I say, hey, check if you're interacting with something, I just tell Mario or Koopa, check if you're interacting with a platform is that a platform will apply to any platform subclass, and I can generalize my code much more easily as a result. So each of these subclasses, you'll explore this on your own a little bit more, but each of them actually don't have any custom code in it. You might want to create some custom code, for example, coin block. Maybe when you hit this, it actually spews out a coin. That's up for you to implement, or maybe a block will actually break up for you to implement. But in mine, I just have them existing with Mario being able to interact. And you'll notice that when Mario hits the side, he seems to kind of stay put, although there's a little bit of finickiness. And in this section, you're going to have your own choices over what things you try to make better or what you choose to add on to. And maybe that's something you want to focus on, or maybe you want to ignore it. Maybe you're totally OK. You're happy with Mario looking like this, which is actually a completely acceptable choice for this project. So let's take a look at the classes that I have going on here and some of the functionality. I'm going to talk you through some of the, more, some of the details of the more complicated things in some uh, of the next videos here. But for now, I'm just going to make my world like normal and prepare it. You'll notice that my Mario is added like normal, just adding it directly. And my Koopa is added like normal directly. But then I run a method for adding the floor. And in this, we're introducing some new type of functionality. The next video will talk more about a for loop. What this does is generate, it's auto-generating the floor for the world, no matter what the size is. So initially, size 600 by 400. Well, what if I made this size double, 1,200? The floor is automatically created for all that area. That's awesome. You'll notice that my blocks have kind of shifted in other ways. Well, we'll talk about that later on while well, that's the case. One other side note for this project is that we aren't going to have time to actually talk about implementing um, scrolling screens. That's a, a bunch of extra work that we're just going to run out of time to do. Let's say I made my world extremely wide. You're totally allowed to do this in your games, but that will mean that you'll have the scroll bar while you're playing, which is fine. I don't mind that in these current iterations. I'm just going to have my Mario kind of explore. You'll see that he's going to end up kind of going off screen here. But if I just crank my scroll bar, Cool. This means I can make really long levels in custom ways and not having it auto-scroll 
we're just going to have to live with it for now because we're going to run out of time. Where did my Mario go? Let's just hit reset. Let's turn it down to something more reasonable in terms of size. Let's just go back to my 600 here. All right, so back here, something more comfortable. So when you're considering implementing your own extensions, this fact that there's a floor everywhere here makes the platformer not particularly difficult. I might want to create some gaps in different spots so that Mario can fall to his death. Something to consider as well. Also, notice that I don't take any damage. I've done that intentionally. If you want Mario to take damage, you're going to have to code that in yourself. What else do we have here? In my world, I've also generated some code for the triple blocks that are automatically generated in the middle here. And let's peek over to Mario. In a Mario class, I have my normal animations like I've been working with previously. You'll notice that there's, from our previous tutorials, things that are very familiar. <coughs> Excuse me. A lot of the code in the Mario class, I have tried not to edit. Well, I've tried to edit as little as possible, I should say. You'll notice a lot of it, hopefully, is very familiar to what you've done in your previous code following my examples. But there is a new section of methods I've created. These methods ensure Mario only moves where allowed. These are the checker, um, basically, collision detection classes that I've developed for you. In a couple videos from now, I'm going to go through these in more detail. But uh, you'll see, first of all, processing animations, updating animations, moving Mario. All this should be very familiar. There's a couple small tweaks I had to make in a couple places here to get things working with our new interactions. Notice that gravity only works when not on the ground and not all the time anymore because that kind of messes up with our checkers. But here down here, we see that there's quite a lot of code going into checking when Mario interacts with the platforms. Set that for a future video but that's one of the big things about this section. My enemy, I have constructed in a way where I have a base class called enemy that has some of the functionality that any enemy would want to mimic. This is the stuff like actually detecting when it's able to stand on things and when to turn its direction around. But I've also thrown in some custom code for Koopa about the unique things he'll do. I've made it in this way so that if you want to make your own second or third or fourth or so on enemies, then it already has some baseline functionality in place that you just have to extend upon. So what does a general enemy have? Well, gravity, movement speed. Let's see what it does. It has a mover class. What does this do? Well, it checks if it's at the edge. Huh. What does edge checker do? It returns true if it's at the edge, false if not. So if we're at the edge, speed is times by minus one. That means I'm flipping the direction of movement. So if I reach the edge of the screen, flip the direction this is moving. Or platform checker. Hmm, what does this do? Return is touching platform. So if this enemy touches a platform, then changes direction as well. So basically this is what allows the Koopa here to turn around and decide to go the other way as soon as it's reached the edge or if he bumps into the side of a coin or any platform at all, actually. So some nice, elegant implementation of being able to do that. What else can he do? Well, apply gravity. We are going to actually have some controls in here for how he interacts with the ground. I'm actually not going to talk you through all the details of this, but make a mental note to yourself that this code follows a similar strategy to Mario's collision detection that I'll talk about in two lessons. So it also follows the rules of gravity. So what then does the Koopa do on its own? Well, the Koopa con contains its specific animations that I've stored here. And it also tracks whether or not it's been touched because it's its own unique creature that has some changing things. So I have a bunch of variables in the Koopa class. And again, you're going to have to explore some of these reading it through on your own and asking questions if you have it. I want you to do some of your own analysis in this section. And I want to know what the Koopa's speed is. And note that I actually stored speed in my enemy class. Speed is stored here. So what I had to do was make a getter method to give me the speed. And then the Koopa just accesses it through the super, access, access, accessing its parent class to know what its speed is. 
And when I create my Koopa, I create it with my constructor, speed2, because my enemy class is expecting speed in its constructor. What else can my Koopa do? Well, he checks if he's touched. If he's touching Mario and isn't already touching Mario, then his touch is true. Set a timer to this. This is something you implemented previously. If I am touched, set a timer, running, and if the timer reaches the end, its touch is false. So this is what allows my Koopa to go into its shell for a little while and then pop back out. You can take a peek at that. Um, actually, I'll add a little comment here because I forgot to do that earlier. The code that allows the Koopa to go into its shell after being touched by Mario. And then after some time, pop out again. Nice. Then we have our animation set up for processing and updating animation, just like we've been practicing for the last while, implemented in a way that should be very familiar to, to you. And then my little jumper method that just says, if 150 ticks of the world have gone by, then do a little jump. It's just a simple timer for it. Maybe your jumping implementation was more advanced. Use yours, that's awesome. I just included a simple one here for clarity's sake. So I have my Koopa's behavior split between two classes some of the more generalized elements in the enemy that you can access for other enemies that you make. Finally, well, I think I already talked about this already, actually, platform, they don't have any unique code themselves. They're just meant to exist with their own images, and then the interactions happen in the classes that interact with them, and they determine how that interaction occurs. All right, so here's what we'll be exploring in the next video. I'm going to talk about this idea of for loops like we see in my world here. And then in the video after that, I'm going to talk about the platform interactions limiting collision detection to give you some idea of how that works so that you can borrow those ideas in your own code. And then we'll talk about the final project. See you in the next one.